Monsters have been the face of our irrational fears and captured our imaginations since the beginning of civilization. Like our fears, they come in all shapes and sizes and meet us in our nightmares. They can be physical manifestations of evil, serve as metaphors that reflect our current anxieties, or they can be cautionary tales about the consequences of man's meddling with the natural order. Movies have been the perfect medium to explore the darker corners of our minds and help create the iconic representations that we will forever associate with these movie monsters. Welcome to Movie Monsters, where we discuss the history of some of horror's most iconic bad guys. On this video, we're talking demons and demonic possession. The concept of good and evil has existed probably as long as the concept of time. Demons are the embodiment of pure evil. There have been hundreds, if not thousands, of reports of exorcisms, dating all the way back to the Dark Ages, when it used to be much more common. The phenomenon all but disappeared until the 60s and 70s when movies and media attention kind of re-sparked the public's interest. Reportings literally increased by 50%. Catholicism is the religion that's become synonymous with possession, however, other cultures have similar beliefs and practices. Exorcisms typically have to be cleared through the Catholic Church and are only performed when they have some sort of proof that a demon has inhabited a host. There's certain symptoms that a priest is looking for when they're deciding whether or not this person truly is possessed, including none of which can be explained away with basic science. And now that we've gotten all that out of the way, let's go ahead and jump into this list. We're going all the way back to 1957 to discuss Night of the Demon, which has nothing to do with the 1988 Night of the Demons film. It's about a detective investigating a satanic cult that he believes are most likely responsible for a string of grisly murders. This may be the first movie to actually portray a demon, but notoriously, the relationship between the director and the producer was not good. The director wanted to take a more grounded approach to the screenplay, while the producer said, we gotta have a monster in it. And as we've all come to know, producers know best, right? Despite the fact that this movie doesn't explore a lot of the tropes that we see in later exorcism films, it definitely portrays a demon, and that's why it's on the list. Some movies just aren't going to neatly fit into one movie monster's category. Like, where the hell would I put Cabin in the Woods? This next movie is an example of that. See, I already did it on the Creepy Kids episode, when clearly, this is a movie about a demon. 1968's Rosemary's Baby. He has his father's eyes. In it, Rosemary and her husband Guy have recently moved into a new apartment complex when they're befriended by a cult of Satanists. One night at a party, Rosemary is drugged and has visions of being raped by a demon. She wakes up pregnant and now she's got the baby daddy from hell. Literally. This is the third entry into notorious director Roman Polanski's apartment trilogy following Repulsion and The Tenant, and it's seen by many to be a masterwork of the horror genre. It really captures the feeling of paranoia and isolation, which is a theme that runs throughout the three of them. Polanski's films are always going to be overshadowed by his personal life and the headlines, but make no mistake, the guy's a fantastic director. What's a little bit eerie about Rosemary's Baby is it was a precursor to the Manson family murders. As iconic as Rosemary's Baby is, it's this next film that set the gold standard for demonic possession and permanently defined the template. 
1973's The Exorcist is an adaptation of William Peter Blatty's novel. It's directed by William Friedkin. I'm the son of iniquity be powerless to harm Your me. mother sucks cocks in hell, oh, Lord, Paris, you prayer. faithless oh, slime. The story follows 12-year-old Regan, which, by the way, makes the movie way more fucked up, as she progresses through the stages of demonic possession and the efforts of a mother and two priests that are attempting to win her soul back from a powerful demon that's taken over. Ask around about the most shocking scene in the movie and you'll probably get several different answers because this movie is so full of boundary pushing moments. Some are gonna say it's the pea soup vomit or the spinning head, but I say the crucifix scene is one of the most disturbing and fucked up things I've ever seen. Friedkin was notoriously hard on the cast. He literally pushed them to the brink just to get the performance that he wanted from them. When you see steam coming from the breath of the characters, it's because the set was nearly freezing. Despite the shock value, this isn't an exploitation flick. It's almost impossible to deny the masterwork of this director and his crew. Incidents such as an on-set fire, a motorcycle accident, and two of the film's actors dying during post-production caused people to believe that the whole thing was cursed. Televangelist Billy Graham said once, there's a powerful evil in the film, in the fabric of the film itself. And security was hired to protect Linda Blair from religious zealots who were anxious to go out and kill her for God, I guess. The Exorcist was released on December 26th right there near Christmas, and the reactions range from outrage, to stun, to vomiting, and even a report of an audience member suffering a heart attack. Roger Ebert gave it four out of four stars, while other critics dismissed it as garbage. But the consensus was that the special effects were outstanding. And when Oscar season came around, the Academy agreed. The Exorcist was nominated for 10 awards, and it became the first horror film to be nominated for Best Picture. There's sequels and an ongoing TV series, so Pazuzu is alive and well. 1981's The Evil Dead kicked off one of the most epic cult series of all time. I have seen the dark shadows moving in the woods and I have no doubt that whatever I have resurrected through this book is sure to come calling for me. Once Upon a Time, Spider-Man director Sam Raimi and the chin known as Bruce Campbell were just two dudes that produced a short film called Within the Woods. They did it as a sort of old school Kickstarter and it worked. The story goes like this. Five college students decide to spend the weekend in a cabin in the woods. All right, that's always a good idea. They go into the cellar at night and find the Book of the Dead along with a tape recorder that, of course, they have to play. The recording recites incantations which end up releasing the spirits of the deadites. Then Bruce Campbell's Ash is gonna have to kill them by dismemberment. They secured $90,000 and off they went. Raimi used handheld cameras and very practical special effects and its lo-fi look is part of the charm of it. The Evil Dead was essentially a test run for the far superior sequel. The Evil Dead 2 would set the tone for the series moving forward. It's dark, subversive, and has a ton of splatter comedy. And it was followed up by my favorite entry, Army of Darkness. There's also a Starz TV show that is unabashedly the Bruce Campbell show, and it's hella fun. Hail to the king, baby. Created by Clive Barker and based on his novella, The Hellbound Heart, Hellraiser follows the story of a possessed puzzle box and the doorway to the world of demons, Pinhead and his Cenobites, a group of perverse S&M enthusiasts that send fans of Fifty Shades of Grey running and screaming back to their mamas. Oh, no tears, please. It's a waste of good suffering. These guys exist in a world of pleasure and pain ecstasy and suffering. Each Cenobite possesses their own unique mutilation, pinheads being the obvious pins in his head. A globe-trotting homewrecker named Frank accidentally solves the mysterious puzzle box that opens a portal to another world before being ripped apart by hooked chains. Years later, his brother Larry and his daughter Christy and Larry's wife Julia all move into Frank's old house. 
Larry has a small accident, some of his blood falls onto the floor, and that triggers Frank's resurrection. Julia was actually still in love with Frank, who is, at this point, just a bloody puddle of yuck living in the room in the house. Frank needs blood to regain his strength, so the pair conspire to murder Larry to bring about the rest of Frank's transformation. After seeing her stepmother bringing men into the house that never leave, Christy steals the puzzle box to keep it away from Frank. She runs away and faints because didn't most of our heroines do that in the 80s? She wakes up in a hospital and solves the puzzle box when Pinhead and his minions make their really big entrance. Pinhead, played by the iconic Doug Bradley, explains that they take anyone that solves the box into the dimension where they torture them for an eternity, and since Christy solved the box, they want her. She makes a deal to give them Frank instead, who's managed to escape this fate. To date, Hellraiser has spawned nine sequels, some good, most not so good. There's a sequel slated for release this year, and it will be the second in the franchise to have someone other than Bradley in the role of Pinhead. It's like Nightmare on Elm Street without Robert England. When your main villain ends up in space, your franchise is dead. And there's no way in hell to save it. This is just part one of two of the Demons episode. If you want to check out the rest, all you got to do is subscribe, Click the bell to enable notifications, and you will know every time a new episode drops. If you did like this, take one second to click that little thumbs up button. It really, really helps me out. And if you're bored, just go ahead and check out the rest of the series. Whether you're interested in vampires, werewolves, aliens, ghosts, zombies, it's all up right now for your viewing pleasure. More to come. Thank you guys. I'm Jeremy. Be terrible.